If on the land and in the air, Russia went to war with Ukraine, having a strong quantitative advantage in numbers of every weapon system available, on the sea such advantage was the most prominent. Initial Russian plans were to use their Black Sea fleet that could conveniently operate in both the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov from multiple naval bases in Crimea in a supporting role for land forces. This is because the Ukrainian fleet was not seen as even a minor threat to any of the Russian ships. The idea included enforcing a naval blockade of both military and merchant Ukrainian vessels just for enough time for land forces to capture the main Ukrainian ports in Odessa and Mykolaiv together with intact assets. Focusing on the first two years of the war, we want to tell you how exactly Ukraine managed to completely turn the tables on the sea, achieving the unthinkable. Without much of its conventional fleet, eventually enforcing its own naval blockade of Russian military ships across the Black Sea by the second anniversary of the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine. Taking a closer look at what assets were involved in the war on the sea, we personalized the Russian capabilities. Prior to the war, most of the Russian naval assets were spread across four main bases, with headquarters in Sevastopol and additional military ports of Feodosia, Donuslav and Novorossiysk. It's also worth mentioning that Russians tried to actively control the skies around the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov, with 38th Fighter Aviation Regiment based in Belbek, the 37th Mixed Attack Aviation Regiment in Gvardiejskoe, the 318th Separate Mixed Aviation Regiment of the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Kacha, and 43rd Separate Marine Assault Aviation Regiment of the Black Sea Fleet in Saki. Thus, Crimea is sometimes called an unsinkable aircraft carrier, on which we will also put emphasis in this video, as aviation there significantly shaped the land and sea campaigns. Coming back to the Navy, the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet is old, but still unmatched in its capabilities as an anti-ship and anti-air asset, guided missile cruiser Moskva. In contrast, the 30th Surface Ship Division features not just Moskva's contemporaries from the 80s, missile frigates Ladny and Petlivy, but also much more modern Admiral Makarov and Admiral Essen frigates that each carry 8 caliber cruise missiles that will be actively used against Ukraine. Besides that, Russians use 5 submarines of the 4th Independent Submarine Brigade, solely as cruise missile launchers. For amphibious assault, they have the 197th Assault Ship Brigade with eight large landing ships. Hoping to support their land forces this way, Russians almost double their number of amphibious assault vessels by moving from the Northern and Baltic fleets six extra landing crafts right to the Black Sea as well. The above-mentioned vessels are the main striking force that Russia plans to use against Ukraine, but the vast number of maritime assets are reserved for supporting roles. Worth mentioning, however, that we will not show here the assets that are officially a part of Russian Black Sea Fleet, but operate outside of the Black Sea and Sea of Azov, such as Admiral Grigorovich frigate or Krasnodar submarine deployed in the Mediterranean. This is because these ships, since the beginning of the war, are barred by Turkey from passing through Bosphorus. The Russian 41st Missile Boat Brigade is comprised of 13 missile corvettes, more than half of which were built after 2018. However, two of the most modern corvettes will be deployed in the Black Sea via inland waterways only in December 2023. 68th Coastal Defense Ship Brigade operates numerous but significantly older assets, which include three anti-submarine corvettes, four minesweepers, and five anti-saboture boats. Similarly, the 184th Novorossiysk Coastal Defense Brigade operates three older anti-submarine and four much more modern corvettes three minesweepers and a few small landing crafts in addition to anti saboteur boats. A few even smaller units also exist to conduct recon missions with two Raptor-class patrol boats as well as Priazovi and the one course intelligence ships. The rescue missions are assigned to 145th Rescue Ship Detachment. Thus, the Russian Black Sea Fleet is a dominating force in the region that is going to be actively used against Ukraine. At the same time, the Ukrainian Navy is thinly spread across two bases in Odessa and one in Ochakiv, one in Verdyansk and one in Mariupol, at the outbreak of the war. Ukrainian Navy's flagship is its only frigate, Hetman Sahaydachny. Ukrainians also have a wild combination of four ex-US island-class patrol boats, disarmed Soviet missile boat Priluki, one main sweeper, one mine layer, and various even more light patrol ships and gunboats of mostly Ukrainian origin. Concerning the amphibious operation ships, Ukraine possesses one medium landing ship and two smaller landing crafts. Together with logistical and decommissioned vessels, as well as Dnipro River flotilla, 
which we will not mention the same as for the Russian Caspian Flotilla, this is all Ukraine can put against the adversary on the sea. Ukrainians also plan to buy four other class corvettes from Turkey, but the war broke out before the order was completed. This leaves Ukraine in a seemingly unthinkable odds against Russia on the sea. Today, we also want to thank as a sponsor of this video, Ground News. Ground News is a news aggregator available across different platforms, designed to help people compare news coverage from across the political spectrum. Working with information myself, it's often quite challenging to keep track of the degrees of bias in different news articles nowadays. In the era where algorithms often echo our own beliefs, Ground News explicitly shows the distribution of left, center, and right-leaning sources for particular news. For example, in this particular article, we can see the slightly more left than right-leaning news outlets cover the topic, with 48% of sources belonging to the center. Each source is also arranged on the political spectrum. Below, we can specifically see what headlines are used by different news outlets. I can also customize my feed to show me the news topics I am the most interested in, while ground news can highlight my own biases. If you are looking for a more profound way to stay informed about events around the world, check out the ground news by visiting ground.news slash war archive. Surprisingly, in the early morning of February 24th, 2022, the first Ukrainian maritime operations begin not in the Black Sea, but in less strategically important Sea of Azov. At 4.30 am, two Russian tankers start moving directly to the city of Mariupol by the shortest path from Yeysk. This atypical behavior is seen on the radar screens of the coastal defense headquarters at Mariupol airport. There, the officers from multiple units responsible for the Ukrainian coastline come to the conclusion that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has begun. The orders are given to start mining the waters near the Mariupol seaport. Ukrainian 9th Division of Surface Ships scrambles to complete it before their adversary makes the next move. In a few hours, they are proven right as Mariupol is attacked by naval artillery of the Russian large landing ships, that apparently use tankers as decoys. Ukrainian artillery strikes back, hitting the old tanker SGV flot and cargo ship Serafim Sarovsky. To the west of Mariupol, approximately 2,000 men with over 30 APCs of the Russian 810s Guards Marine Infantry Brigade land on the desolate Ukrainian shore. The Russian command planned to deploy these troops right in Mariupol, but eventually changed the destination due to the timely mining of the Mariupol seaport. Being disorganized, these troops likely took part in the capture of Berdyansk on February 27th and advanced towards their end destination, Mariupol, only after linking up with Russian forces that advanced from the Crimean Peninsula. Specifically in Berdyansk port, Russians captured Ukrainian Akerman and Vyshkorod gunboats. Russian aviation from Crimea, meanwhile, starts executing strikes on Ukrainian territory as Russian land forces advanced towards Kherson and Argodar and Mariupol. From Kherson, they would be able to effectively move their large number of mechanized forces to key ports of the Mykolaiv and Odessa, with eventual plan to reach Transistria, part of Moldova that is currently an internationally unrecognized state with extremely close ties to Russia. According to captured maps, two days are reserved for the complete encirclement of Mykolaiv, and one more for Odessa. With no doubt that the land forces will accomplish this mission, Russians also plan to support them with amphibious landings from large landing ships once cities are encircled. As of February 24th, however, the Russian Black Sea fleet, while maintaining distance, enforces a blockade of Ukrainian ports. At the same time, 230 kilometers from Mykolaiv, on the rocky outcrop of the Snake Island, the events take an unexpected turn. Lying near the coastline in the southern part of Odessa region, the island, with an area of one-fifth of square kilometer, is located near the main sea trade routes that originate from Ukrainian southern ports. Before the full-scale invasion, Ukrainians used it as a reconnaissance outpost and training grounds for landing exercises, which will play a big role in the future events. The distance from the Snake Island to the nearest coast is only 37 kilometers. Russian forces, since the first day of the invasion, decided to storm the island to enforce the blockade and set up a military base there, deploying air defense systems, troops and artillery. Prior to the invasion, Ukrainians had around 80 soldiers as an island garrison, including Ismail border guards, marines of the 35th Brigade, and a few civilians responsible for the lighthouse. 
A 12-mile economic zone around it is justified by the only village on the island called Vile. It numbers a few houses inhabited solely by Ukrainian military personnel. On the morning of the February 24th, 2022, they all were awake, receiving the news from the land about missile strikes and columns of the Russian tanks crossing the border. The commander of the entire garrison of the island, Bogdan Hotsky, recalled that the first sign of the imminent attack on the island was a radio transmission to a bypassing civilian vessel from a Russian military ships with instructions to avoid approaching the island. They warned that the area was presumably mined. Ukrainians, now aware of the presence of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, however, still do not see them. Taking their positions, soldiers realize that they don't have any sufficient armament to conduct full-fledged defensive action. Meanwhile, Russians use open frequencies in attempts to convince the Ukrainians to side with Russians for large monetary compensations. But the island's defenders continue to ignore these offers, making preparations for an active resistance. As bribing the island defenders does not work, Russians switch to sending the ultimatum, threatening to use the ship's armament against Ukrainian soldiers, the Russian patrol ship Vasily Bykov sails in close vicinity of the island. Soon, the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet Moskva itself appears on the side of the Ukrainians. It serves not only as mighty air defense battery and missile carrier capable of destroying everything on the island in minutes, but also as a command and control center of all current naval operations in the region. As Ukrainians do not respond to the ultimatum, Russians conduct the first airstrike on the Snake Island with a Su-24 bomber, inflicting no casualties. The demonstration of force, however, seals the situation for defenders as completely hopeless. Closer to the evening, Ukrainians on the land intercept the famous words, with which island defenders responded to the Russian ultimatum. The following extremely brief but infinitely fearless phrase became one of the first symbols of Ukrainian resistance. Due to heavy strikes on the island that were a result of failed negotiation attempts, communication with defenders was lost. After that, the Russians conducted a landing and captured a Ukrainian garrison. Soon, Russians start delivering a large amount of personnel and equipment to the island, including radars, drones, MLRS and various air defense systems. The place is turned into a Russian outpost in the sea that now plays a major role in naval blockade as well as complicates any use of the Ukrainian air force in the region. On February 26th, Ukrainians, still having no contact with the garrison, send a Sapphire search and rescue ship to the island with a civilian crew to evacuate the defenders or, in the worst case scenario, their bodies. The ship, however, is captured by the Russian Black Sea Navy. On February 28th, Ukrainians decide to scuttle their flagship, frigate Hetman Sahaidachny, which was undergoing repairs near Mykolaiv to prevent its possible capture. Prior to that, Ukrainians also likely scuttled another ship, Vinnytsia anti-submarine corvette that was decommissioned in 2021 and permanently stationed in Ochakiv. Russians see these events as a sign of imminent victory, but the resistance of Ukrainian armed forces and civilians only grows with time. Neither attempts to drop paratroopers from helicopters nor raids of sabotage groups on small boats bring Russians closer to the encirclement of the city. The further details of Mykolaiv defense, however, deserve a separate video. As March begins, the situation in the sea reaches a certain balance. Russians firmly control Snake Island and the Ukrainian coast, enforcing the maritime blockade. They are, however, aware of the quite dense sea mining that Ukraine has managed to achieve near key cities, so the landing operations are postponed. The weather is also getting worse, so eight Russian large landing ships that were sailing in the vicinity of Odessa currently stay near Donuzlov. Ukrainians, on the other hand, actively move their few remaining assets, effectively avoiding Russian missile and aviation strikes, but stay close to the shore and under the protection of mines. Ukrainian boat Preluki 
patrols the water near Odessa, while it's observed from a distance by Admiral Makarov, an unidentified Grisha-class corvette, which try to intimidate the city's citizens. On March 3rd, a Ukrainian Slovyansk patrol boat conducts reconnaissance mission, sailing a little bit further than usual. This was a risk, but Slovyansk is one of the few assets that provides vital intelligence after the Ochakiv port reconnaissance infrastructure was significantly degraded by the Russian missile strikes. The boat is soon attacked by Russian Su-34 that hits it with a H-31 anti-ship missile, killing the crew and sinking the vessel. The only Ukrainian minesweeper, Anichinsk, meets the same fate as it also sunk around this time after the Russian missile strike. Meanwhile, on March 5th, the Russian task force of eight large landing ships misses another small window of good weather for landing operation, so the vessels return from the area of Donuzlov back to Sevastopol. On March 7th, Ukrainian MLRS attacks some targets in the sea at night, possibly damaging Veliki Ustu corvette of Caspian Flotilla that will later appear in photos with significant damage. On March 13th, Russians no longer approach the Ukrainian coast, but again deploy their large landing ships near Donuzlov, while Moskva returns to Sevastopol, leaving Admiral Essen and Admiral Makarov to patrol the area of the Snake Island. In the Sea of Azov, Russians attack the Mariupol seaport on March 15th, damaging with missiles and drones the Ukrainian Navy ships Lubny and Kremenchuk. The personnel of the 9th Division of Surface Ships evacuates to the port and joins the Mariupol defenders, who are fighting in a complete encirclement at this point. To further stretch Mariupol defenders, Russians attempt to infiltrate through the sea mines in the port on Raptor-class patrol boats. These lightly armed and fast vessels transport small Russian sabotage and reconnaissance groups right to the shore. Ukrainians, however, quickly react to this threat from the sea and soon a video appears of Azov soldiers attacking a Russian patrol boat with Concourse ATGM from the shore. The first missile hits the boat that was doing an amazing maneuver, but the second one misses, allowing the Russians to escape. It's likely the first time in the history that the ship was successfully damaged with anti-tank guided missile. As we explained in our separate video dedicated to the defense of Mariupol, the Russians have to concentrate more and more forces around the besieged city, as Ukrainians resist stubbornly and inflict massive losses on the adversary in bloody urban warfare. For this reason, they decide to supply the left flank of Mariupol encirclement through the captured Verdansk port. At 7.45 am on March 24, three Russian large landing ships Saratov, Sazerkunikov and Novocherkask dock at Verdansk port. Sailors start unloading the ammunition from Saratov, which can carry up to 1000 tons of cargo, when suddenly a massive missile hits the ship. All ammunition aboard starts detonating, causing multiple secondary explosions and engulfing the vessel in fire. The shells, rockets and pieces of hull fly around, damaging Cesar Kunyukov and Novocherkask's ships, which immediately head out of the seaport. On board of the both ships, fire and smoke are visible, which indicates that they were at least slightly damaged. The fire on Saratov went out only when the ship submerged underwater after catastrophic damage to the hull. The unexpected strike was carried out by Ukraine with Tochka U ballistic missile that scored a direct hit on the Russian ship. With a range of 120 km and a 2-ton warhead, these missiles are the only real long-range weapons that Ukraine possesses at the beginning of the full-scale invasion. Saratov becomes the first Russian large landing ship that was destroyed by Ukrainians, who by all means try to degrade enemy logistics in the south. For the next three weeks, however, Russians maintain complete control over the situation in both Sea of Azov, where they use ship artillery to attack Mariupol, and the Black Sea, where they enforce the naval blockade of cities which Russian land forces failed to take. This status quo, however, is abruptly interrupted by the unthinkable. On the evening of April 13th, Ukrainian land radar surprisingly detects Moskva missile cruiser, which alone patrols the area near Snake Island. Russians, however, aware of Ukrainian coastal defenses, were confident that their flagship was invincible against any kind of attack. Ukrainian coastal defense battery launches two R-360 Neptune missiles at Moskva, scoring two direct hits at the ship that even did not try to defend itself. Russians aboard panic and the crew evacuates, while the heavily damaged vessel is picked up by two tugboats. While being towed to Sevastopol for some time, the ship suffered even more damage due to ammunition detonation as the crew failed to battle the fire on board. Shortly after that, the flagship of the Russian Black Sea fleet sinks, 
becoming not just the largest military vessel ever destroyed by an anti-ship missile, but also the largest one destroyed since World War II. We explained possible reasons why the Russian cruiser was not able to repel the Ukrainian missile attack in a separate video, but here we want to focus on its strategic significance. Moskva is the only Russian ship in the Black Sea that was armed with the long-range anti-air missile system S-300F, which allowed it to control the skies not only over Snake Island, but almost from the western coast of the Crimea to key Ukrainian southern ports due to remarkable 90km range. This made the ship a key asset of air defense that had to assist in the future amphibious landings. After Moskva's sinking, as well as after failing to not only reach Odessa but even encircle Mykolaiv by April, Russia's plans to land their infantry and vehicles on the Ukrainian coast are no longer on the table. On the other hand, the Ukrainian command starts making their own plans on how to gain further advantages, given that the biggest threat is eliminated right now. These plans culminate in decision to challenge Russian control over Snake Island. The loss of the Moskva cruiser meant that Russians no longer had sufficient air defense in the region, which prevented Ukraine from even attempting to attack with the drones. Moreover, after the flagship sinking, Russian ships no longer approached the Odessa coast, closer than 150 kilometers, of the radius of effective use of Neptune anti-ship missiles. In these conditions, the Russian garrison on the Snake Island remains without much naval support and with serious disruptions in supply delivery. Ukrainians immediately start the systematic destruction of all military equipment that Russians had brought to the island, prioritizing the remnants of air defense. On April 26th, a Ukrainian Bayraktar TB2 drone strikes and destroys the command post on the island, as well as the Strela air defense system. On the 30th, three ZU-23-2 anti-aircraft guns, another Strela, and as well as communication equipment and vehicles. On May 2nd, the drones methodically target Raptor-class boats, which were likely carrying supplies and personnel. This shows how Russians quickly switched to smaller ships that are way harder to find and hit with anti-ship missiles. Ukrainians, however, now rely on drones to do this job, which turns out to be the correct strategy. On May 3rd, Ukrainians struck the command post on the island again, also destroying the Russian ammunition depot. At this point, Snake Island was turned into a graveyard for the Russian equipment and soldiers, who simply had no place to hide from Ukrainian drones, which constantly pound them with precision-guided missiles. On the same day, Bayraktar TB2 destroys the last air defense system on the island, Russian Tor, as well as Cerna-class landing craft. On May 7th, after complete destruction of Russian air defenses, a pair of Ukrainian Su-27s flies over the island, striking it with unguided bombs. All these efforts, however, are just a shaping operation before the main attack. On the morning of May 7th, Ukrainian commandos of the Defense Intelligence of Ukraine start the landing operation on Snake Island. The plan, developed by Kirill Budanov, requires operatives of GUR and SBU Alpha to be swiftly dropped on the island with helicopters, attacking Russian troops from a few different directions. Yevgeny Solovyov, hero of Ukraine and commander of the crew that delivered the operatives on that day from Chervonohlinsky airfield, described an operation as extremely risky, as in the absence of the wind, the helicopter could be heard at a distance of 8 to 10 kilometers. This meant that the enemy forces would be ready for the air assault. For casualty evacuation, Ukrainians keep an additional helicopter, Mi-14 in the air nearby. Meanwhile, all four Mi-8s and four Mi-24s successfully get to the island, which means that Ukrainians indeed have managed to completely suppress enemy air defenses. After a quick landing, the operatives of the GUR split into groups of four and begin the assault on the museum building located on the island. The helicopters immediately take off, leaving the dangerous area where commandos engage in brutal combat with the Russian garrison. Ukrainian boats also approach the island for the short time to support the landing, but soon retreat after losing one amphibious assault boat, Stanislav, due to missile launch from a Russian plane. The Special Operations Unit of the Security Service of Ukraine, SBU Alpha, also successfully lands on an island and launches an attack from a different direction. Struggling to avoid unintentional friendly fire, Alpha uses grenade launchers when pounding part of the Russian garrison in the museum building. The defense intelligence operatives begin the direct assault on the museum, 
and quickly take a foothold inside, eliminating what was left of the Russian garrison there. Moving forward, soldiers passed the broken lighthouse and the border guard building. Ukrainians engaged in another brutal skirmish with Russians near the destroyed windmill. As a result, both sides take significant casualties and the Ukrainian command decides to evacuate their raid group from the island. This decision could be explained by the assumption that Russians might have been in the process of preparing aviation or ships for massive island bombardment as a measure of last resort. Russian garrison remains were too weak to pursue Ukrainians, so the special operation forces successfully returned back on the continental part of Ukraine on helicopters, including three wounded sailors out of eight crew members of Stanislav boat. The operation could not be called a complete success or failure. Ukrainians inflicted significant losses on the Russian garrison, but also lost around 10 operatives. Mi-14 helicopter, reserved for the emergency casualty evacuation and piloted by Colonel Ihor Bazdai, the deputy commander of the Ukrainian Navy, is shot down by Russian fighter jet near the coast of Odessa, with one survivor among the crew of six. Following the operation, the 10th Navy Aviation Brigade, where he had served since 2004, was renamed in his honor. On the next day, Mariupol defenders also significantly damaged another Russian Raptor-class patrol boat, killing four crew members. Ukrainians decide to maintain pressure on Snake Island further, as the garrison is significantly weakened now. The attacks are continued mostly with long-range artillery and by Raktar TB2 drones. Russians, on the other hand, rush to resupply and evacuate wounded from the island with which they no longer have a stable communication. Under constant attacks from the Ukrainian boats and drones, on the next day, they miraculously managed to drop the vital cargo from N-26 military transport plane that evaded two Manpads missiles from the Ukrainian boats. They also tried to establish at least some logistics with Raptor-class boats, but one is destroyed and one is damaged by Ukrainian by Raktar TB2. At night, Russians also employed their own Mi-8M Tasha of the 487th Separate Helicopter Regiment in a risky mission to reinforce the island garrison. The Ukrainian by Raktar, hovering above the helicopter, hits it with a precision-guided missile, instantly destroying the aircraft with the Russian reinforcements inside. It is the first known air-to-air -air kill by a drone. After this series of disasters, Russians employ medium-sized ships like Sevolod Bobrov and Spasatel Vasily Beh to resupply missions, even installing TOR anti-air systems on the second one. They expect that these ships cannot be easily destroyed by Ukrainian Bayraktar drones, but also are hard targets for the anti-ship missiles. Ukrainians, however, acquire US Harpoon anti-ship missiles on mobile trucks from Denmark with a range of at least 140 kilometers as soon as May 28, further strengthening their position in the Black Sea. Just in a few weeks, on June 17, during one of the routine resupply missions, a Russian tugboat with a Tor air defense system, Spasatel Vasily Beh, is hit by Harpoon. The second missile also scores a direct hit in a few seconds after the first one, which is filmed by Bayraktar TB2. In minutes, obliterated Russian tugboat sinks further showing that Ukrainians are determined to recapture the Snake Island. On this very day, the photos of the damaged Veliki Ustyuk corvette surfaced. Belonging to the Caspian flotilla, the ship was likely damaged by Ukrainian MLRS system and was towed along the Volga River away from the Black Sea. On June 20th, Ukrainians carry out the largest combined attack on the island. These strikes destroy the Panzer S-1 air defense system, a radar station, ground equipment and military personnel on the island. On the same day, the Ukrainian armed forces launched a missile strike on the Chernomor Naftohaz natural gas rigs that had been occupied by Russia since 2014. Using Harpoon missiles, Ukrainians damaged two out of four facilities, Tavrida and Ukraine, as Petrohodovanets and Sivash are out of missile range. This was done for several reasons. Firstly, the structures were used for the placement of radars and electronic warfare equipment. Secondly, Russian ships often tried to hide behind them from missiles and radars. Thirdly, the rigs were the bases where Russian helicopters landed and rearmed for conducting missions in the area. After this, and the second similar strike on June 25th, at least the Tavrida Jakob rig will be on fire for three weeks, indicating that Ukrainians were successful in their attacks. On the other hand, during either reconnaissance or close air support mission on June 26th, Ukraine loses one SU-24M 
which is likely shot down by the Russian air defense system stationed on Snake Island. The plane of the 7th Tactical Aviation Brigade, with call sign 84 wide, was piloted by Colonel Mikhail Matyushenko and Major Yuri Krasilnikov. Both pilots were posthumously awarded the title of Hero of Ukraine. The Ukrainian strikes on the Snake Island follow on June 27th and 30th, further degrading the Russian ability to defend and resupply the garrison that was decimated in each attack. Moreover, on the 29th, Ukrainians destroyed one of four K-52 helicopters that were approaching the island. Russians likely tried to evacuate its crew with Mi-8 of the 39th helicopter regiment on the next day, but it was also shot down. As a last blow to the Russian Black Sea fleet on this day, near captured at this point Mariupol, they lose a Kula-class landing craft, D-106, which hits the sea mine and sinks. Russian command finally sees that Snake Island turned into a black hole for the troops and equipment, even though they formally continued to enforce the blockade on the Ukrainian ports on the Black Sea and captured the whole coast of the Sea of Azov. At this point, the capabilities of the Russian Black Sea fleet do not allow effective control over the key island. On June 30th, the Russian officials claimed that their troops had completed all their assigned tasks on the Snake Island and that the evacuation from it is a goodwill gesture to demonstrate that Russia does not prevent the establishment of shipping corridors. Thus, after the last Russian troops abandon their equipment and evacuate, by July 7th, Ukrainian operatives of the 73rd Naval Center of Maritime Special Operations land on the Snake Island, raising the Ukrainian flag over it again. Covered in bomb craters and charred remains of the Russian equipment, the rocky outcrop forever became one of the symbols of Ukrainian courage and perseverance as only a few in the beginning of the war saw retaking it and ending the Russian naval blockade possible. On July 22nd, just two weeks after the return of the island, the so-called Black Sea Grain Corridor initiative was signed in Istanbul. It made it possible to unblock the Ukrainian ports of Odessa, Yuzhny and Chernomorsk and resume grain exports to Africa, Europe and Asia. Kirill Bodanov, one of the key commanders responsible for the liberation of the island, stated that this operation was incredibly important to open up shipping in the area. Despite the relatively small size of the returned territory, this operation is still one of the most successful and famous ones. It also marks the end of the first phase of the war for the Black Sea. Since the first day of the invasion, Ukraine showed that through immense courage, genuine inventiveness and indomitable self-belief, the country with no fleet could find asymmetric strategies that could lead to the victory of a superior enemy. Most importantly, throughout the next phases of the war for the Black Sea, we will see the manifestation of the same qualities as a recurring pattern, which eventually will accumulate into a paramount strategic shift. The second phase of the war on the sea starts at the end of July 2022. After the recapture of the Snake Island and the beheading of the Russian Black Sea fleet, Ukraine significantly boosts its economy through the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which allows the export of 33 million tons of grain and other food products to 45 countries worldwide. Most importantly, renewed trade is a sign of success of the first phase of the war, which further boosts Ukrainian confidence. The Black Sea, however, is far from being a peaceful place as it was before February 24, 2022. Russia continues to use Black Sea fleet ships and submarines as launchers, indiscriminately attacking cities across Ukraine with hundreds of cruise missiles every month. To combat that, the Ukrainian command decides to build and deploy not conventional ships, but a fleet of unmanned surface vehicles or simply sea drones. Having no time to spare, Ukrainians build secret facilities, test different technologies and complete the first USV prototypes as early as July 2022. Ukraine also starts designing and building its first unmanned aerial vehicles for long-range strikes. The stockpiles of ballistic Tochka U missiles was likely exhausted, so Ukrainians rush to make relatively cheap, self-destructing drones that can be temporary substitute for conventional cruise and ballistic missiles. As an immediate solution, Ukrainians also buy Mugen-5 UAVs and turn them into either kamikaze drones or droppers of grenades and other explosives. In the context of this video, we only briefly touch on attacks on Crimean Peninsula. As we mentioned before, Crimea functions as a logistical hub for the southern grouping of forces, as well as base for multiple units of the Russian Air Force and the Black Sea Fleet. Since September 2022, 
Russians also start using Crimea as a primary location for launching waves of Iranian-made Mohajer-6 strike and Shahed-136 kamikaze drones to hit predominantly civilian targets and try to overwhelm adversary air defenses. Ukrainian Navy ships play a big role in repelling such attacks in the ports of Odessa and Mykolaiv. Officially, the first Ukrainian attack on Crimea happened on July 31st when the small explosive drone attacked the headquarters of the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol. Although the damage was extremely small, this event is a precursor to the whole Ukrainian campaign of air raids on the peninsula. On a sunny afternoon of August 9, 2022, two large explosions rocked the area near the town of Novofedorivka. Saki Naval Air Base with the 43rd Fighter Aviation Regiment of the Russian Air Force for the first time comes under Ukrainian attack. The tourists witness large smoke clouds over the base, usually referred to as cotton pops among Ukrainians, which are visible from any part of the peninsula. Earlier, it was considered that Ukraine does not possess weapons that have over 200 km range necessary for such an attack. But on this day, everything has changed. As Russians state that no military equipment was damaged, the stellite images tell a completely different story. There are four distinct craters from what are supposed to be main missiles. It's also very likely that the munitions used had a cluster warheads, as many planes are damaged and destroyed at significant distances from the craters by some kind of submunitions. In total, the missile attack destroyed at least eight planes and most likely damaged two. Even though we have good satellite images, in the end, there are way more questions than answers. For example, the weapon used is still a mystery. Grim-2, Ukrainian short-range ballistic missile complex, has been under development for years and presumably was never used before. Another candidate is the modified Neptune anti-ship missile. In the retrospective, it's possible that the first tests of this missile system against ground targets were conducted on Saki Air Base. There is also a possibility that the attack was carried out by modernized S-200 anti-air missiles, re-engineered into a ground-to-ground -ground system. The use of heavy UAVs, such as 241, as a loitering munitions is also possible. Just in a week after the strike with a known weapon, the huge ammunition depot in Maiske village near Jankoy is blown up. Throughout August, Ukrainian attacks with UAVs happen once every two or three days, causing panic in the tourist-oriented region. Russians considered their air defenses in Crimea to be sufficient protection against any attacks, as they even deployed a few batteries of their most modern SAM system, S-400, for the protection of strategic objects. The drones, however, still reach the targets in Sevastopol, Belbek, Jankoy, and Cape Fioland, where Russians have their military infrastructure. Ukrainian UAVs also start targeting Russian ships, as they are much easier to hit than planes on the airfields or air defense systems. Moreover, Ukrainians for the first time use sea drones in addition to air ones. On the night of September 17th, the frigate Admiral Makarov in Sevastopol Bay is simultaneously attacked by both UAVs and USVs. However, the raid fails due to the fact that Starlink terminals, which were the main means of communication for drones, did not have coverage in the Sevastopol area. Ukrainians also argue that Elon Musk ordered the coverage to be turned off there and refused to turn it back on, citing escalation concerns. One of the drones, which likely lost connection during an attempted attack, was found on the coast near Sevastopol on September 21st. Ukrainians urgently modify the drones to no longer rely on Starlink. Between the first and second attacks on Sevastopol, the security service of Ukraine also attacks Crimean Bridge with a truck bomb on October 8, 2022, disabling part of it for almost half of the year. We covered this event in detail in a separate video. The second attack on Sevastopol Bay is conducted by Ukrainians on October 29th, Operatives employ nine UAVs and seven USVs that successfully damage Frigate Admiral Makarov and minesweeper Ivan Golubets outside Sevastopol Bay. It will take a little bit less than a year for Admiral Makarov to undergo repairs and officially return to the fleet on August 15, 2023. After that, however, the satellite images made in September 2023 show the ship towed by tugs, so the vessel is likely still significantly impaired. Worth mentioning that Russian abilities to repair ships are quite limited in the Black Sea, as the main Soviet shipyards were built not in Sevastopol or Novorossiysk, but in Mykolaiv, which became an unreachable target for Russians. On October 30th, 
A video of Ukrainian Yuri Oliferenko landing ship surfaces, where it fires its 140mm rockets towards unknown targets. Before, on June 3rd, Russian drone footage was published where the ship was under inaccurate but still dense shelling in the area of Hochakiv, where the vessel apparently evaded Russian attack. The fact that the only landing ship, which is easiest target of the Ukrainian Navy, still conducts operations indicates very limited Russian reach. On November 4th, however, Russians damaged a Ukrainian Gursa M class gunboat in the sea with Lancet UAV. Similar attacks happened in April on Yaroslavets class boat near Zaporizhia. On December 23, 2023, on another Gursa M gunboat near Ochakiv, and in March 2024, on an island class patrol boat near Ochakiv again. The pattern of attacks shows that Russians constantly try to hunt down Ukrainian remaining boats, but due to air defenses, resort to using only UAVs that are unable to destroy most of the vessels irreversibly. On February 10, 2023, it turns out that not only Ukrainians operate sea drones, Russia deploys its own explosive USV to the Black Sea, targeting the bridge at Zatoka, which already was victim of multiple missile strikes before. It is the only direct land connection from Odessa region to Buchak and Romania. The bridge sustained significant damage, but Russians do not use the sea drones again, which hints that the device used was likely a prototype without further development. On the morning of March 14, 2023, a Russian Su-27 fighter jet intercepts and damages an American MQ-9 Reaper drone over the Black Sea by hitting it and dumping fuel on top. The United States' reaction was extremely mild, as representatives of the US Air Force called the incident reckless, environmentally unsound and unprofessional. The Russian Defense Ministry rewarded the pilots with medals for something they call preventing an American drone from violating Russia's temporary airspace. The American drone, however, was flying over international waters in the Black Sea when two Russian Su-27s approached it. This resonates with early incidents when on September 29, 2023, a Russian Su-27 fighter jet over the Black Sea fired a missile at the British RC-135W spy plane that eventually malfunctioned and failed to reach the aircraft. The next patrol mission, RC-135W conducts while being accompanied by two Royal Air Force Eurofighter Typhoon multirole jets. Same goes for French E3F that from now on is accompanied by Rafale fighter jets. Here, it's also important to highlight the fact that US drones and NATO reconnaissance aircraft in general often patrol the area and potentially share the collected intelligence with Ukraine. The above incidents do not substantially change that, but still raise attention in the skies above the Black Sea. Ukrainians repeat the attempt to attack Russian ships in Sevastopol Bay on March 22nd, with at least three sea drones, and on April 24th as well. The attacks likely did not reach the target, as Russians use helicopters, patrol boats and booms to protect their ships. The bay is also better protected against flying threats due to increased number of anti-aircraft guns and missile systems deployed nearby after previous attacks. Thoroughly analyzing the results of the first attacks, Ukrainians come to the conclusion that it will be much more productive to attack ships once they are outside of the bay and preferably alone in the sea. They don't have to wait long for such thing to occur, as Russians still feel safe in the southern part of the Black Sea. On May 24th, 140 km from Bosphorus Strait, three Ukrainian Magura V-5 drones attacked the Ivan Hurs intelligence ship. Two of the drones were destroyed by machine gun fire while they approached the vessel, but one reached quite close and either damaged the ship lightly or malfunctioned, as Ivan Hurs returned to Sevastopol without visible damage. Magura V-5 is likely an improved or simply finished design of an earlier seen nameless prototype USV used for attacks on Sevastopol Bay. The second Russian intelligence ship, Priazovia, was unsuccessfully attacked by at least one Magura V-5 drone on June 11, 300 kilometers away from Sevastopol. From these two attacks, Ukrainians learned another crucial lesson. The drones, at least the newly developed Magura V-5, are vulnerable to machine guns and especially auto-cannon fire so the attacks must be conducted only at night, when they cannot be spotted from afar. Besides UAVs, in June, Ukrainians start using newly acquired Storm Shadow and Scalp EG cruise missiles provided by France and Great Britain in May 2023. Adapted to be launchable from Ukrainian Su-24s, 
the missiles perform well against high-value targets, such as command posts and bridges that connect the Crimean Peninsula and the continental part of Ukraine. Russian air defenses in Crimea can intercept only a small fraction of these missiles. At the same time, storm shadows are provided by Ukrainian allies in quite small quantities, so domestically produced drones are still a relevant weapon. By some accounts, Ukrainians also start attacking Crimea with re-engineered S-200 missiles that were surface-to-air missiles, but now could be used in surface-to-surface -surface mode against targets, such as Crimean Bridge. Here, phase 2 of the battle for the Black Sea comes to an end. Between July 2022 and July 2023, Ukrainians systematically attack Russians with both air and sea drones, trying to find weak spots and refining the strategy. The Black Sea Grade initiative, which was a major success of Phase 1, is still a compromise because the Russian fleet controls the southern part of the Black Sea. To further lock it in the ports, Ukrainians, throughout Phase 2, experiment with USVs and UAVs, attacks on the Black Sea fleet and military infrastructure, learning that it's optimal to attack Russian ships when they are far from the ports, sail alone and at night. They also plan to further limit Russian capabilities with long-range attacks using an arsenal of Storm Shadow and domestically produced missiles. All this constitutes an incredible quantitative and qualitative jump in weapons compared to Phase 1, and the Ukrainians don't hesitate to use this to eventually enforce their own blockade of Russian ports. Phase 3 starts with security service of Ukraine using a new drone type called Sibaby in the second attack on the Crimean bridge on July 17, 2023. Two of the five drones have managed to reach the target and damage railroad and road portions of the key supply route. Three other drones were short on fuel and attempted to locate the Russian frigate Admiral Essen, but failed to do so and self-destructed. The attack is a second successful strike on the Crimean bridge, which is remarkable if we take into account that Russians tried to defend it at any cost for its strategic and symbolic meaning. Furious with such an attack, Russians withdraw from Black Sea Grain Initiative on the same day. However, the deal was set to expire soon, so withdrawal practically made little to no sense. After repeated attacks of the Ukrainian sea drones on the Russian intelligence ships, the Black Sea fleet was also unable to control the ship ineffectively, so withdrawal was indeed just a political move. On the next day, Russians conduct heavy missile and drone strikes specifically on grain export infrastructure in the ports of Odessa and Mykolaiv, trying to disrupt the trade. Soon, understanding that such attacks were useless, they declared the strikes served as a revenge for the Crimean bridge. Unable to stop maritime shipping due to chances that merchant ships might be protected by Ukrainian sea drones, Russians completely lose control over sea trade routes, and Green Deal is basically transformed into Ukraine exporting and importing goods in the same way as prior to the war. On August 1st, three sea babies attempt to attack Sergei Kotov and Vasily Bykov corvettes, 340 kilometers southwest of Sevastopol, but are unable to approach and hit two ships. This attack, however, is a sign that Ukraine is trying to use the new type of drone not only against the Crimean bridge, but also against the Russian ships. A similar unsuccessful attack with the Sea Babies also happened on July 25th. On August 4th, Ukrainian Sea Baby and New Mamai drones for the first time reached Novorossiysk, the largest Russian port and naval base located outside of Crimea. The improved range compared to Magura V5 allows drones to attack port infrastructure. Ukrainians also used Numamai drones to heavily damage the large landing ship, even though Alingorsky Gornyak stays afloat. It has a heavy listing and leaks fuel, so Russians have to use tugboats to tow it to dry docks to the north of Novorossiysk. The last Russian sea base that seemed out of reach for Ukrainians turns out to be vulnerable to modern Ukrainian drones. At night of the same day, the Ukrainian Mamai drone also attacks and damages the Russian product tanker SIG in Kerch Strait. The tanker is a civilian vessel, but it was used to carry fuel for the Russian forces in Syria and was likely involved in delivering fuel to Crimea, after the Crimean bridge was damaged again. The ship survived the attack, sustaining heavy damage. On August 23rd, near the village of Oledivka, on the Tarhankut Cape, Ukrainian defense forces for the first time attack the Russian S-400 missile system, obliterating two launchers with the crews. The attack was filmed by Ukrainian reconnaissance PD-2 UAV. What is interesting is that the attack was carried out by a new version of the R-360 Neptune missile. 
with a range allegedly increased to 400 km, and a new guidance system developed after the start of the full-scale Russian invasion. Both the fact that Ukrainian reconnaissance drones can easily fly over such strategically important objects, and that the most modern Russian SAM system is easily taken out by modernized missile from the 80s, once again highlight the problems in defense of Crimea. On August 24, 2023, on Ukraine's Independence Day, operatives of Artan and Bratsvo Special Operation Units of the Defense Intelligence of Ukraine conducted the first landing on the coast of Crimean Peninsula since 2016. Elite forces numbering around 20 men approached Cape Tarhankut on individual jet skis around 5 a.m. After landing, they immediately attacked the Russian base of the 3rd Radiotechnical Regiment in the area of towns of Olenivka and Mayak. The base houses antennas, jammers for electronic communications over a wide area and advanced Nebo-M and Kasta 2 2 radars. Splitting into groups of five people, commandos engaged in brutal combat with Russians who did not expect the attack. Killing over 30 men, Ukrainians blow up Russian antennas and radars with grenade launchers and retreat to the beach, from which all 20 operatives uninjured take a six-hour trip back to the Ukrainian-controlled territory. Raising their flag on the Crimean Peninsula for the first time since 2014, on Independence Day, Ukrainians not only show an example of incredibly successful raid of special operations forces, but also decrease the Russian situation of awareness in the sea before their next move. In the second half of August, Ukrainians also launched a series of operations near Snake Island. The special unit Artan of the Ukrainian Defense Intelligence plans another landing on all four gas rigs in the Black Sea that were captured by Russians in 2014. As mentioned before, these facilities were actively used as temporary bases for resupplying Russian helicopters, as well as placing raiders and jammers. Several groups of Artan operatives approach Ukraine and Tavrida rigs on high-speed Willard 730 boats. After successful landing on the rigs that were previously damaged by Ukrainian missile strikes, commandos capture Neva radar system, as well as a lot of ammunition for Russian aircraft. As the mission was classified, many conflicting accounts start surfacing, including the Russian Ministry of Defense claiming that the boat with Ukrainian operatives was sunk. In response, Ukrainian Ministry of Defense publishes a video showing several Ukrainian fast-speed boats maneuvering under the autocannon fire of a Russian fighter jet. Eventually, Artan operatives fire a MANPADS missile at the Russian Su-30SM, which likely damaged it or just scared the plane away so that it had to return to base. On August 27th, during one of the phases of the operation, one of the boats with Ukrainian troops engages in combat with Russian Su-30SM aircraft patrolling the area again. During the skirmish, one of the operatives, called Sign Conan, falls off the board and, due to intense fire, signals his colleagues to leave him. The board, slightly damaged at this point by playing autocannon, has no choice but to retreat, avoiding fire from the Russian jet. After returning to the base, Artan's command immediately begins a search and rescue operation despite the danger of another encounter with Russian forces. Meanwhile, the operative, stranded in the sea, tries to stay near the gas rig, battling with strong current. Eventually, exhausted, he lies on his back and drifts. His thermal signature is picked up by Ukrainian Bayraktar TB2, thanks to seagulls that decided to sit on him. After spending 14 hours in the open sea, Conan is successfully rescued by his colleagues, who send a boat for him. On September 11th, the Defense Intelligence officially reports about taking back control over rigs in a series of raids, seizing all enemy equipment and pushing the Russian control zone further away from the Ukrainian coast. Most importantly, Russian helicopters no longer can resupply there, so Snake Island, as well as most of the unoccupied Ukrainian coast, from now on, are out of range for them. On September 3rd, the Ukrainian Bayraktar TB2 attacks and destroys the Tunets patrol board that was used by Russians for landing in the northwestern part of the Black Sea. For a while, the drones of this type were not used in direct attack role. This might be explained by the fact that Russians have managed to adapt their air defense systems to detect by Raktars after these drones inflicted massive losses in manpower and vehicles during the liberation of Snake Island. After such adjustments, the incredible optics of the drone was likely used for reconnaissance purposes, but not in attack mode. This is because by Raktars, became an easy target for Russian SAMs and fighter jets 
due to relatively short range of its precision-guided weapons in comparison to standard surface-to-air or air-to-air -air missiles. After the destruction of multiple S-400 air defense systems, Ukrainians correctly expect that Crimean strategic objects are more vulnerable to missile attacks. Ukrainian command decides that it's the right time to strike Black Sea Fleet ships with their best long-range weapon so far. Identifying targets with ISI satellite both with ones raised by Ukrainian volunteers, they conduct a long-range strike with Storm Shadows on September 13th. This time, cruise missiles are accompanied by US-made ADM-160 Mountain decoys as well, which helps the attack to penetrate weakened Russian air defenses. Launched from a safe distance by Ukrainian Su-24s, missiles swiftly pass over the area where Russian S-400 used to be before destruction and approach the Sevastopol shipbuilding plant. A small group of Ukrainian commandos also conduct a landing nearby to observe and correct the strike. Meanwhile, missiles rapidly descend upon reaching the targets and hit the Russian large amphibious ship Minsk and rostov on don submarine in dry docks. A direct hit on Minsk's superstructure ignites a fire that was not put out for hours, effectively destroying the vessel. The rostov on don submarine, used for attacks on Ukraine in the role of cruise missile launcher, is also hit by one of the storm shadows. Photos released on September 18th show huge holes in the hull, supporting the claims that the submarine is damaged beyond economic repair, same as Minsk. The hull in torpedo compartment, in addition to one on the starboard side, also indicates the detonation of munitions and subsequent catastrophic internal damage. rostov on don became the first Russian submarine lost during the Russian-Ukrainian war, and the first submarine in history to be destroyed by cruise missile. On the next day, September 14th, at around 5.30 am, Ukrainian UAVs attack the radar and antennas of the S-400 located on the outskirts of occupied Yevpatoria between the villages of Molochne, Udyutne and Zaozerne. After that, the missile launchers are destroyed by the two R-360 Neptune missiles, launched in a ground-to-ground -ground mode. A clear sign that Russian air defenses are still vulnerable against combined attacks, even if the weapons used are not that sophisticated. In the sea, the situation for Russians is not much better. Ukrainians use sea baby drones to damage Corvette Samum in Sevastopol Bay, as well as Sergei Kotov in the northwestern part of the Black Sea on September 14th. The attacks indicate that Ukrainians continue to actively produce their sea drones and are determined to reach Russian ships all over the Black Sea. On September 20th, Ukrainians launched Storm Shadow missiles and successfully hit 744th communication center of the command of the Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. On the 22nd, the Sevastopol itself is attacked with missiles. Storm Shadows score a few direct hits on the headquarters of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, killing and wounding dozens of high-ranking Russian officers. From practically destroyed building, the Russians have managed to evacuate the heavily wounded commander of the Russian Armed Forces Group in Zaporizhia region, Colonel General Alexander Romanchuk, and his Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Oleg Tsekov. The initial claims about the death of the commander of the Black Sea Fleet, Viktor Sokolov, turned out to be false. The operation was named Crap Trap. At first, Ukrainians actually hit the communication center to make sure all officers were in the headquarters, and not after that, attacked the building with missiles right during the meeting. Allegedly, Ukrainian partisans of the Atesh group on the territory of Crimea provided vital intelligence for the operation's success. Ukrainians launched another strike on Sevastopol in less than 24 hours after the first one, targeting the 758th Center for the Black Sea Fleet Logistics and Technical Support as well, likely trying to kill the survivors that were relocated there from the headquarters. By some accounts, as a result of the Operation Crab Trap, over 30 Russian officers were killed and over 100 other servicemen injured in just three days of accurate missile strikes. In October, Ukrainians somewhat decreased the number of attacks. They damaged Corvette Pavel Derzhavin and the rescue ship Professor Nikolai Muru on October 12th, as well as the intelligence ship Vladimir Kosicki on October 26th. Sea Baby drones were used for each attack. On October 4th, Russian sources reported that Ukraine has tried to conduct another raid on Crimea and Tarhankut Cape, sending 16 commandos of the Timura unit of the Defense Intelligence on jet skis and aboard in a similar manner to raid on August 24th. The raid, however, was only partially successful, as photos show not only Ukrainian troops in the Crimea again, 
but also confirmed that one Ukrainian operative is taken as a prisoner by Russians during the operation. In October, Crimea is also repeatedly attacked with missiles and drones. Ukrainians take this month to carefully analyze the actions of the Russians after previous devastating attacks. Having no headquarters and with Sevastopol naval base in the danger zone, Russians start preparing the relocation of many ships to Novorossiysk by the end of the year, which is at least out of range for deadly storm shadow missiles. At this point, constant Ukrainian attacks force Russians to adopt risk-averse strategies, keeping ships most of the time in guarded ports. Even though it makes each ship a hard target for the sea drone, the dilemma arises as such vessels become much easier to hit with missiles. This way, on November 4th, Ukrainians heavily damaged the Russian U.S. Cold Corvette in the Zaliv shipyard. At the time of the attack, a scold was unfinished. The surfaced photos indicate the direct hit on the superstructure, radar and missile launchers, making the ship damaged beyond economic repair. The missile also hit the industrial plant nearby, but a scold was likely a primary target as it can carry eight caliber cruise missiles that Russia still actively uses against Ukraine. On November 10th, in Vuska Bay, Ukrainian sea drones attacked two Russian landing crafts of Akula and Cerna class. While one of the vessels delivered a BTR, the drones silently approached them and hit the ships. The destruction could also be verified using satellite images. On December 5th, a Russian Su-24M belonging to naval aviation is shot down by Ukrainian forces over the Black Sea in the area of Snake Island. Both crew members did not survive. Some sources speculate that the fact that the bomber maintained a safe distance from the Ukrainian shore but still was successfully hit indicates that Ukrainians for the first time used their US-made Patriot air defense system for the protection of Odessa region. The subsequent and almost simultaneous destruction of three Russian Su-34s in the Kherson region in 17 days only reinforces this version. Until the end of December, Ukrainians continue multiple drone and missile attacks on Crimea, but not USV raids, as Russian ships rarely leave the ports. They find their next big target only once the Russians decide to bring more missiles and drones to Crimea using another large landing ship on December 26th. Novocherkask, which was slightly damaged after the strike in Berdyansk that was mentioned before, delivers either Shahed 136 drones or caliber cruise missiles to the naval base in Feodosia for upcoming massive missile attacks on Ukraine. At the same time, Ukrainian Su-24s launch Storm Shadow missiles, which score a direct hits on Novocherkask, causing the detonation of the cargo. In seconds, the ship is torn apart by enormous internal explosions, littering the nearby city with fragments of the hull. The explosions were so strong that with Novocherkask, the Russian training ship, a former T-43 class minesweeper, sunk as well since it was too close to the obliterated vessel. Between December 28th and 31st, the patrol boat of Project 205P Toronto is also destroyed due to explosions of unknown origin. The ship was not a part of the Black Sea Fleet, as it was likely captured Ukrainian border guard vessel in 2014. At the same time, over the Sea of Azov, on January 14, 2024, a Russian A-50U airborne early warning and control aircraft scans the surroundings with its huge radar. Working together with IL-22 Air Command Post, the aircraft now substitute previously destroyed radars in Crimea. Suddenly, a missile hits A-50, leaving no chance to a large and slow aircraft. The second missile explodes near IL-22, critically damaging it and killing a few crew members. The two strategic Russian aircraft are hit over 100 kilometers from the front line, in an area that was thought to be completely safe. As engulfed in fire, A-50 with its whole crew disappears in the waters of the Sea of Azov, IL-22 eventually will land in Anapa, with extensive damage beyond economic repair. The loss of A-50 is devastating for Russian Air Force, as only nine planes of this type were initially in service. The significance of the loss of a dozen high-ranking officers and rare specialists who were able to operate such an aircraft also should not be underestimated. What is more surprising than that is the readiness with which Russians deployed the second A-50 to the area. Now, claiming that the previous plane was shot in a friendly fire incident, the Russian command keeps the second aircraft further from the front line. However, 
On the February 23rd, a second Russian A-50U is shot down over Krasnodar region, near the village of Trudova, Armenia. Being 250 kilometers from the front line, at the moment of the impact, it could have been the victim of improved Ukrainian S-200 SAM system, the other candidates for the first attack like Patriot or S-300 do not have sufficient range for the second attack. After losing over 20% of all AVAX aircraft in the service, the Russians suspend the flights of A-50 planes near Ukraine, losing a powerful tool for collecting intelligence. On February 28th, Ukrainian operatives of the 73rd Naval Center of Maritime Special Operations attempt to land on the occupied by Russians Tandorovska split. The operation, however, is likely unsuccessful, as photos indicate that one of the boats was damaged and washed up on the shore. Four Ukrainian commandos are killed in action, and one is allegedly wounded and taken prisoner while the rest have to retreat. This shows that even though Ukrainian special operation forces have a stellar track record of complex operations, sometimes they also make fatal mistakes. At the beginning of 2024, Ukrainians also start using all their tremendous experience with the sea drone attacks to strike the Russian fleet even more aggressively and lethally. On the night of January 31st, 12 kilometers from Sedonuslav Bay, Ukrainian Magura V-5 drones locate and attack Corvette Ivanovets. The ship received multiple hits as Ukrainians first attacked from the rear to immobilize the vessel. After that, precisely controlled drones strike the same spot multiple times to achieve explosions as deep as possible inside the hull. Eventually, the missiles on board of the Ivanovets detonate, and in minutes, the ship sinks, which is recorded by one of the drones. The new approach to disable the ship rudders and propellers first and then attack with multiple drones in the same spot is reflected in the following attacks. On February 14th, Ukrainians locate and then attack large landing ship Tsar Kunikov near Alupka. Magura V-5 drones disable its controls first by attacking from the rear and then start ramming into the hull. The crew desperately tries to destroy the drones with machine gun fire, which is captured on video, but Ukrainians attack at night, making sure their drones are hardly visible. After the few successful hits and one of the drones literally exploding inside the ship, Cesar Kunikov turns to the side and sinks. Ironically, at this point all three ships, Saratov, Novocherkask and Cesar Kunikov, which actively supplied Russians at the beginning of the war through the Berdyansk port, are destroyed. On March 5th, using Magura V-5 sea drones again, Ukrainians attack the Russian corvette Sergei Kotov near Kerch Strait. The presented video shows the ship hit by three drones, causing significant damage. Russians attempt to tow the ship to the port, but Sergei Kotov sinks five kilometers from the coast of Cape Takil. On February 6th, commandos of the 73rd Naval Center of Maritime Special Operations also conduct an Operation Citadel in the Black Sea. They first identified that Russians installed an antenna on the sea mining platform for reconnaissance drone Mohajer-6 and radars to coordinate attacks on the Ukrainian coast with Shahed UAVs. After careful planning and preparation at night, the boats with groups of commandos approach the structure in the open sea. After successful landing, they get to work destroying Russian equipment and thoroughly mining the place. After operatives depart on boats, they blow up the platform from a safe distance, preventing Russians from using it again. At the same time, Russian military command, furious with devastating losses of the Black Sea fleet, replaces its commander, Viktor Sokolov, with Sergei Pinchuk. This change, however, looks like a redundant move as Pinchuk has served as the chief of staff and first deputy of Sokolov since 2021, so the failure of Russians to maintain dominance in the Black Sea was his fault as well. As Russians leave only a few ships that are undergoing repairs in Sevastopol Bay, Ukrainians decide to finish them off with one decisive missile strike. Launching a combination of Storm Shadow and Neptune missiles in their biggest attack on the Crimea so far, Ukrainians hit multiple targets in Sevastopol and the nearby 13th ship repair plant. Satellite images show that missiles with high degree of certainty damaged large landing ships Yamal and Azov, as well as scored direct hit on the above-mentioned Ivan Kurs intelligence ship. Russians, however, quite successfully prevented photos leaking this time, so the extent of damage could not be verified for now. In April, 
Ukrainians get a new batch of Atacams ballistic missiles and start actively using them against Russian targets in Crimea. At night on April 17th, missiles with cluster warheads destroy four S-400 air defense missile launchers, three radar stations and air defense control center. With Fundament M airspace, surveillance equipment, Russian helicopters and planes will be preemptively relocated likely to prevent high losses of aircraft, similar to ones due to previous Atacams strikes that were showed in a separate video about Operation Dragonfly. The relocation further from the front line, however, not only decreases the effectiveness of the Russian aviation, but also does not guarantee safety at this point. For example, on April 27th, the Security Service of Ukraine executes drone strikes on the Kushevskaya military airfield, possibly destroying either Su-35 or Su-34, along with stockpile of guided bombs. On April 30th, Ukrainians conduct their most significant attack with Atacams on Russian air defenses in Crimea, successfully hitting targets on Jankoy Air Base again, in addition to Chernomorske, Donske, and Saki district. In Donske, the base of the air defense unit of the Southern Military District is destroyed, while in Jankoy, likely two more S-400 launchers are damaged. As the bulk of Russian long-range air defenses in Crimea suffered heavy losses, Ukrainians on May 4 attack Susaninske, where Russian short-range ballistic missile complexes are deployed. Iskander Ams, which Russia uses for its own attacks on Ukrainian air defenses, air force bases and civilian infrastructure, were never destroyed before. The outcome of the strike is up to debate, but images clearly show that the place, where missile launchers were located, was subject to a massive fire. On May 13th, Ukrainians take out the base of the air defense unit of the Russian 3rd Radio Technical Regiment on Ipetri Mountain. On the 15th, Belbek airfield becomes the next target for over 10 Atacams with cluster warheads. According to the satellite images, ballistic missiles destroy the S-400 air defense system that was supposed to protect the airfield, as well as MiG-29 and two rare MiG-31 jets. One Su-27 is likely damaged. In conclusion, after Ukraine acquired a significant number of Atacams ballistic missiles, its relentless attacks on Crimea persistently devastate Russian air defenses. S-400, regarded as one of the best air defense systems in the world, in reality are incapable of repelling the combined attacks of various Ukrainian drones, Storm Shadow crews, and especially Atacams ballistic missiles. Of course, it's a question of time when the necessary improvements will be made, but Ukrainians persistently inflict irreversible damage to Russian forces on the peninsula, taking out not only a variety of Russian military equipment, but also dozens of air defense, air force and electronic warfare specialists. Attack camps are also used against ships as on May 19th, Ukrainians strike the Sevastopol Bay. After the attack, both Kovrovets and Cyclone ships disappear while the vessels that were stationed with them are relocated, with many sources supporting the claim that Cyclone was definitely sunk. The fate of Kovrovets is unknown. A rescue boat with a diving complex for underwater technical work was spotted near the place where Cyclone was located and nearby buildings have sustained damage. Sister ship of previously destroyed Escold also carried eight cruise missiles, which made it one of the priority targets for Ukrainians. During spring 2024, the footage of new modifications of sea drones surfaces, including Magura V5 with two R-73 air-to-air -air missiles, likely to counter Russian helicopters, which is a main weapon used to hunt down USVs. In addition to that, another Russian footage also features Ukrainian drone used as MLRS to strike Russian positions in Kherson region. Further published photos indicate that this was modification of Sea Baby with 622mm rockets from Grad. Thus, Ukrainians continue to experiment with the sea drones, trying to adapt them for the new tasks. In the two-year-long struggle for control of Black Sea, the world witnessed surprising role reversal between Ukraine and Russia. Having almost no sea capabilities in the beginning, Ukrainians, similar to their land operations, used their small resources with maximum effectiveness, buying precious time. During these crucial first months, which were summarized as Phase 1, the number of striking successes, such as sinking of the Moskva and directly related to its liberation of Snake Island, allowed Ukrainians to break through the Russian naval blockade. In the time period which we designated as Phase 2, spanning from July 2022 to July 2023, Ukrainians further grow capabilities, first and foremost developing sea drones able to target Russian ships. Their goal was simple, to destroy most of the Russian Black Sea fleet 
and lock the rest in the ports without a chance to be used against Ukraine. At the same time, Crimea turned from a place outside of Ukrainian reach into a place of active strikes where Ukrainians were destroying Russian military infrastructure, personnel and assets almost weekly with UAVs. Finally, in Phase 3, which started in July 2023 and continues as this video is released, we can see striking examples of effective use of completely developed Ukrainian sea drones, as well as the successful employment of assets provided by allies. As the war enters its third year, Ukraine can now reach and effectively destroy Russian ships at any point of the Black Sea, as well as disrupt supplies to Crimea by persistently damaging the Crimean bridge. This resulted in almost a complete relocation of around two-thirds of the Black Sea fleet to Novorossiysk from Sevastopol, which served as the main Russian naval base in the Black Sea for almost 260 years. One-third of the Russian fleet, however, was heavily damaged or destroyed, which makes the situation pretty desperate if we take into account that no shipyards in the Black Sea are safe and new vessels cannot join the fleet. Thus, by the second anniversary of the full-scale Russian invasion, Ukraine has managed to impose its own naval blockade after inflicting significant losses on an adversary with the first in the world fleet of sea drones.